Hello everyone, welcome to NPTEL course Rural Water Resource Management, week 4, lecture 2. This week we will be looking at components for understanding groundwater hydrology. More focus will be kept on how to understand the properties to recharge better and store the water in the groundwater aquifers and then what are the losses that can happen. So this week uh, the groundwater hydrology started with understanding where the water comes in through the hydrological cycle. We also looked into how the space or a space where water can be stored reduces as you go along the depth. So which is like this, when you go down deeper, the water would not be stored more because the size of the void spaces, the space where water can enter is reduced drastically. So where is groundwater stored? So what is it called? We, we call it as voids and water gets in, right? But there is a name given for it, so aquifers. So you would be learning about this term when you go more technical into groundwater. They'll call it as groundwater aquifers. Last week when we spoke about groundwater components, I said the government of India has a plan on mapping the aquifers, which is the boundaries of the water supply uh, schemes and within that where the boundaries of the aquifers, the water, uh, groundwater aquifers are there because then they can supply water to irrigation or domestic water supply. So what is an aquifer? So an aquifer is the medium which stores your water. It can be made up of rocks. You can have a consolidated aquifer where purely rocks are there. Uh, and within the rocks, there are spaces where the water can be stored. Then you have uh, partially weathered rocks, uh, which are called semi-consolidated or fractured rocks where water can be uh, stored in the fractures. And those are called uh, fractured aquifers. Then when you go up further, you have the unconfined aquifers, which is not under tremendous pressure of uh, another layer on top of it. So it is open and water can infiltrate. Okay. So we saw that in different terms also. So the zone of aeration, zone of saturation is purely depends on the amount of water. So please differentiate between saturated and unsaturated. Like the term says, it is a degree of water available in the aquifer. So if it is full, we call saturated aquifer. If it is not full, we call unsaturated aquifer. Even 10%, 50%, the same term is there, unsaturated. Only when it is fully with water, we call it as saturated aquifer. Moving on, uh, how does it store water? As I said, there are four spaces and those spaces store water, but it also has to stay there for longer time. If it is keep on moving down, then there's no point of calling it as an aquifer. Okay, it, it should be slower, relatively slower so that plants can take it up, trees can take it up, farmers can take it for uh, their agricultural fields or even your uh, domestic uh, pumps can take it for domestic use, drinking water. Even government schemes are there for drinking water purposes. Okay, so moving on, what do we have is uh, how does water get stored? So let's start with the precipitation. You do have a porous medium and multiple porous mediums. In this example, we have two porous mediums on the top and one porous medium on the bottom. So three layers. Okay. And in between the layers, you have an impermeable layer, which is separating the whole chunk on the top from the bottom. So now you had three layers and then now you have an impermeable layer which is dividing the whole three into two sets, one plus two and then another one on the bottom. Let's start from the top. So all these have porous medium. Uh, let's understand that all these three have porous medium. Depending on the water, it is called saturated or unsaturated. 
Okay. So now let's look at where the aquifer, the term aquifer comes. Water gets recharged. Okay. It goes into the porous medium. First phase, it is still not saturated fully. So it is called unsaturated aquifer. This part where you can see is an unsaturated aquifer, not much water. Then water comes down here. You have a saturated aquifer. After the water table is reached and water doesn't flow down more, but laterally. So you have a saturated aquifer. You also have another saturated aquifer on the bottom. So depending on the saturation of water, you can have an unsaturated aquifer or a saturated aquifer. Now coming back to the terms of confined or unconfined. Okay, so is this aquifer confined? Yes, it is a confined aquifer. Why? Because your water is coming in through the porous medium. Right here, it's not confined. If you confine this, what happens? Precipitation cannot come in. So please understand that confined means it is not like blocked on all sides. Somewhere it has to reach out. Somewhere water has to come in. So that is this part. You can leave that part. Then water comes in through the porous medium <clears throat> and actually recharges, saturates the porous medium. And then it becomes a confined aquifer because it is confined between two impermeable layers. So one layer on the top and one layer at the bottom. So it can move laterally or it can get stored in one place. It is called a confined aquifer. The perched water table or perched aquifers uh, are another uh, aquifer type where it is perched and held uh, somewhere because of a geological process. We'll get into that uh, in the next slides. But uh, please understand that here we have a confined unit and that's why it's called a confined aquifer. Another type of aquifer exists on the top, which is not confined, which means on the top, there is no confining unit. It is pure land. It is, it is a permeable land. Water can come in. So it is an unconfined aquifer. So aquifer can be called saturated, unsaturated. Aquifer can be called confined or unconfined. Then there is another aquifer, which is totally based on the nature of the rock, consolidated, unconsolidated, okay, or semi-consolidated. So let's get into that. And um, understanding here is we understood what is the aquifer. We understood how water gets stored in the aquifer. It is by porous space. And also the potential gradient should not be too dynamic or too uh, high. If it is too high, water just goes down. Okay, for example, water is entering here. Do we call this as an aquifer? No because water doesn't stay there for long. It enters and because of the sudden gradient, it just moves down. But after that, after that, after the water table, a stable water table is reached, we call it as an aquifer. And then we have a non-regular uh, case where we have a perched water table or a perched aquifer. It is formed because suddenly when uh, the weathering was happening or the plates were moving, uh, some deposition of an impermeable surface happened intermediately and that stayed, it didn't move. So water cannot move in and break it, so water gets stored. So that is a perch water, it's not common. Okay, so please understand that uh, it is one of, uh, you won't see it much common in nature, uh, but still it is uh, good to be understanding that such a situation happens. Let's continue with the different types of aquifer, right? We discussed the zone of aeration versus zone of saturation. So you have a saturated aquifer, unsaturated aquifer. Then depending on the confining unit presence, is it present or not? Then we had a confined aquifer versus an unconfined aquifer. You see, this is the confining layer as it's mentioned here. And so number two is called the unconfined aquifer. For the term aquifer to be used, you should have a water table established. So you have a water table established and therefore there is an aquifer. Then you have precipitation coming down and it is being sandwiched between two impermeable layers. So it is called a confined or artisan aquifer. Artisan only when there is a well. So if you don't have a well, it is normally called as a confined aquifer. Other terms here that we didn't look previously is the aquilude. 
what is an acqui loop for us understanding for this course it is good to understand that acqui loop acqui tag bedrock all these units all these surfaces are highly impervious water cannot move in so you can just think about these terms as a block for ground water movement vertically so what happens it won't move vertically but it can move laterally it forms like a pathway for lateral movement so it is aquitard aquilub bedrock these kind of terms or impermeable layer confining layer all these are are impervious layers or less permeable layers which means water cannot move in it has to move sideways so different types are confined uh, and unconfined aquifers very commonly used uh, so if you go to groundwater books from the government of india they would mostly talk about confined aquifers and unconfined aquifers uh, how many unconfined can you have only one right so because on the top of the surface you have the only one open surface you have one unconfined aquifer but underneath you can have after you have an impermeable layer it becomes a confined layer another layer can come here if if possible because nature is complex you can have many many layers those all would be unconfined aquifers you won't have a confined in between an unconfined aquifer because already this layer is there which is impermeable so you can have an unconfined aquifer and after some time after another uh, impermeable layer you can have another unconfined aquifer so please understand that it's not just one unconfined aquifer you can have within the unconfined aquifer there are different wells even the wells are called confined aquifer wells unconfined aquifer wells and an artesian well is just free flowing water just water comes out because of the potential difference that is also not much common all the wells you see in the field most of them uh, i would say 99% of them you still have to put a pump to extract the water only when you put in the bore well and uh, establish the well or develop the well you see water gushing out because the initial pressure is to be released and once that is released it is a normal well you have to put a pump and extract it formation of different types of aquifers now we know uh, what is a different type of aquifer let's just keeping it unconfined and confined let's see how they are formed confined aquifers are created by alternating aquifers and confining units deposited on a single dip so this is your dip you could see here and as i said there are there could be multiple unconfined aquifers so the first aquifer on the top is confined think about a full confined aquifer right here and then suddenly there is a deposition of a confined aquifer or confining unit impermeable layer it pushes down and it is a confining unit then another layer another layer so by movement by plates moving by your land mass moving or by deposition okay so it says here it's a deposition on a dip so this is your dip and on top of it water related movement can deposit or sand can be deposited by a uh, wind so by different drivers deposition happens the key driver is water because water takes sediments etc so suppose you have a dip and water is sedimenting and confining layer on top then what happens this this layer becomes your confined unit and then afterwards it is an unconfined unit on the top on top of here and then another layer comes another layer comes so you you are creating more layers by deposition and that deposition would lead to multiple confined units with one unconfined unit on the top so this is your unconfined unit on the top and then underneath it you have a confined unit then you have a impermeable layer and then another unconfined unit impermeable layer and another confined unit so that is one process by deposition okay on a dip a dip is a land which is dipping in uh, and then you have and it could be your oceans your waves waves can deposit material uh, and then it can become unconfined and confined those kind of things so confined aquifers the second uh, figure can also be created by deposition of alternating layers of permeable sand and gravel and impermeable silt and clay deposits in intermontane basins an intermontane uh, basin is where mountains are there okay 
uh, a watershed with a lot of mountains. Uh, what happens on the top of the mountains is a lot of erosion because uh, it is there, high potential, weathering is happening, rocks break, movement comes down. So when it moves down and you have an unconfined aquifer, okay, confined aquifer is created by the version of alternating layers of permeable sand and, gra and gravel and impermeable silt, the silt and clay in the mountain basin, like it could be from the rocks, it could be from the deposition of rainfall through surface runoff, streams, etc., depositing. So you have a, an unconfined unit, but unfortunately, your silt clay can be deposited on the top. So now what happens? This silt and clay layer becomes impervious. Water cannot move down further. It's very hard, so it will move this way. So the sand and silt underneath it becomes a confined aquifer. Same way, another big storm comes, another silt uh, uh, can be formed on top, uh, silt and clay on top of your sand. So sand deposits and permeable gravel are always coming down, right? You could see big stones coming down, sand coming down, uh, but the silt and clay can be deposited by a big event, a big flood. So after a flood, so that's why you don't have these uh, confined and confined uh, happening uh, multiple times. It is only when there's a big 100 year flood or a big event, uh, a big movement of rocks, then you find these confined units forming. So you can visualize a unit which was first unconfined became confined because a layer got deposited on top of it. Okay, so that is this figure explaining. The next one is confined aquifer created by upwrapping of beds by intrusion. Okay, you have your seabeds, and because of intrusion of waterways, uh, waves, etc., then you have your confined units created. Okay, it's a more complex geological process, but the understanding is clear that two different uh, forces have to combine and collide, and then it gets deposited. Okay. So this is one way, this is another way, and then it gets one below the other, dipping or, or deposition, et cetera. So confined aquifer created by upwrapping of beds by intrusion. So intrusion happens, and because of the, uh, that, there's upwrapping, upwrapping on top, one on top of the other. And if the upwrapping unit is uh, impervious layer, it becomes a confined unit. You can see how units are formed. Confined aquifers created when aquifers are overlined by confining beds. So this is the simplest term to tell how confined aquifers are formed. It, are, it is formed when aquifers, like unconfined aquifers, are overlaid by confining beds, confining material, confining layers. So any layer which goes on top of an unconfined aquifer converts the unconfined aquifer into a confined. And all this is at a big big time scale don't think that tomorrow i'm going to have a confined aquifer from an unconfined aquifer it won't happen that way if it's a big flood and then sudden movement that is fine earthquake that is fine uh, but those processes don't happen every day that's what i'm trying to say if it happens in one location in uh, a big flood comes in the ganges but you don't expect the next year another one would happen okay so please think about that in an earthquake prone zone like Nepal, you would see more often happening. But again, it is a big movement, big uh, force that has to come through. The first aquifer story. So this is a very uh, interesting, as I said, it is not that common, but as a groundwater hydrologist, you should also know that where this can happen. So as I said, some so suddenly there's a clay layer. All this could be a porous layer, let's say sand, silt, uh, and suddenly you see a clay layer because it was not, it got deposited there and it didn't move. So all the clay would have moved, but this just stayed there or it didn't weather out. All the others weathered because of soil uh, exposed to sun and water, but this clay layer never got exposed. So what happens is it stays. Now let's imagine a rainfall happening. So you have precipitation happening. All these materials uh, would take the water through infiltration, get stored, so it becomes uh, an unsaturated aquifer. And here you have aquifer which is saturated because your water table is reached. But on top of it, you have an unconfined uh, aquifer, and inside that, water can get stored. Water can get stored, not all the water goes off because there's a big void space. Water just goes and gets stored in the pocket. And that is called a perched water table. 
And when a farmer unfortunately hits it, within a couple of distance, he or she can pick the water, but then in the water drill, the boat drill cannot go further. So the water, all the water can be used. They will be happy for some time, but then it runs out faster. But another farmer has to go deeper and then get all the water from here. Another thing you could see is because when the water table just gets up, when the water volume gets up, up, added up, suddenly it has to get released. And how does it get released? Through springs. So when you drive through mountains, especially in Maharashtra, through the gorges and, and hilly regions, you'd see that because they broke the hills to put the roads, you'll see water gushing out from the hills. And that was because of the water recharging and coming out. And there could be some perch water table. Uh, and it sees some, some openings, some openings or um, um, weaker sections in the land where water can come out. And that is how water comes out. What is it called when all the springs combine together as a big spring? It becomes a waterfall. Okay, so all these are related through the groundwater, not just rainfall, but groundwater is the key. So all springs are fed by groundwater. So when water comes on the top and comes down, it is a river or, is, or overland flow, stream, et cetera. Only when water goes down under and comes out, it's called spring, it springs out. So that is why the name comes spring. And then it mixes into your river as, as normal. The first aquifer form above the main water table on a lower permeability layer in the unsaturated zone. We've seen these where it is weak and then you have water. Properties of aquifers um, and water table of the aquifers. As I said, the water table is established for a particular region based on the level of water in the aquifers. Okay, so you have a level and the water table is reached. That is your potential at the surface, the potential head, we call it. And water moves from high potential to low potential. So if you want to see the gradient or the direction of water moving, it will be from your left to the right in the screen. So the properties of aquifers are water table of the well is here. An artesian well is right on the surface. On the surface, you will see water. So that is an artesian well. Some water would flow, but most importantly, water is at the brim, at the, at the ground, okay? So you will easily take the water out because the water level is there. And a free flowing well is some well which is lower at a lower elevation or, or at a higher uh, pressure. So the potential is high compared to the atmosphere. So it just go from high potential to low potential. So all of these wells are tapping on the aquifer, but this opening of the well is below the potential of uh, potential surface. So that is why water comes up. Okay. Again, it is not that common, but it is good to understand. Here, what do you see? A confining unit on the top, a confining unit on the bottom, and you have your aquifer. So you understood that all these are based on the rock type. And that's where the geology is very important. So let's go back to the geology. Uh, and the Central Groundwater Report has done this beautiful map of mapping the key geologic material across India. And from that knowledge, from knowing about the rocks, because every rock has its own porous space, has its own fractures of volume, how much water it can store, uh, we could easily estimate what is consolidated and consolidated uh, aquifers. Okay, so let's look at this legend, groundwater potential, yield per, uh, liters per second. Yield is given as liters per second. Uh, if it is unconsolidated formations, where formations uh, are, are not, you know, confined, okay, it's not consolidated. Um, so you have more potential for water to be taken up. Consolidated to semi-consolidated, some broken uh, parts are there, but most of the rock is still consolidated, okay. So it is not broken, uh, but still the rock is tight. Uh, so which means the pore space is very limited, that is consolidated. If it is semi-consolidated, some weathering is there, so it's a little bit more pore space is there. All these would yield a very low yield compared to the unconsolidated formations. The consolidated formations are most like soil, silt, clay, alluvial, etc. It's broken, so we have more space. And then the hilly areas. Hilly areas are very, very less because there's nothing much uh, of pore space. It is just hills. 
and water hits and flows. So you, and the elevation is also there. The slope is there. So water hits and then flows. Okay. So this would also give you an idea where to do agriculture, right? If you know the yield, you do related agriculture. So here you could put rice, sugarcane, etc. But here you have to be very careful on what type of crops you use because the yield is very less. So that is the cautious that we can get from uh, these kind of hydrological maps. The other thing I would like to also touch upon is it is not uniform. So suddenly you have a high yielding aquifer and then you move down, you have a low yielding aquifer and then wherever the rivers and streams are, uh, you have a high yielding aquifer, okay? Uh, and then there could be alternated, unconsolidated, consolidated, etc. and hilly areas can become consolidated after it is a little bit weathered. So a little bit weathering, you have more. So weathering gives you more space, more space for water to be stored. Think about a rock. If you crush it, there is more space inside the rock. Water can go inside the rock. But if you just have a rock, it cannot go much because it is a, on the surface, it might get wet, but it doesn't get in. So that is the understanding from biological maps. And using that, we can also name aquifers as unconsolidated aquifers, consolidated aquifers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. With this, the aquifer uh, types, formations have been covered. I'll see you in the next class. Thank you.